When George Washington invented the wireless gaming headset, he was quoted as saying, Now, finally, we can say the N-word without a profit incentive. Am I a gaming YouTuber still? Do I still need to introduce myself as one at my Porn Addict Anonymous meetings? Because it's it feels embarrassing, honestly. I, being a YouTuber in any industry is being a bottom feeder in that industry. And being a bottom feeder in the gaming industry is like being the janitor in a whorehouse. You know the thing about trying to find sources for history videos. By the time I've actually found one that isn't trying to charge me $20 to hear the opinion of some guy that wrote centuries ago, I've got a browser filled with tabs crowded at the top of my window. So I go back to my script, write down what I was looking for, go back to find the reference, and I gotta go through every single tab of random internet garbage that I have opened because I don't learn lessons. I don't want a better way. I want to suffer. But you're not like me, which is to say, you're smart. So you search the answer to one of life's great mysteries on YouTube, and you find the answer. Seven years I've lived here, browsing the web. I spend my days contemplating life's deepest questions. How do I keep track of so many tabs? So I help Opera make a browser that's as peaceful as a quiet Norwegian village. Now managing those unruly tabs is only a click away. It is just so perfect. This man is right. Look at his sweater. Of course he's right. Why do I suffer? Why does the research, writing, and stupid internet garbage that I consume all crowd the top of my window? Too compact to read without clicking on it again. Why does the internet, the world's greatest repository of information, not allow me to intuitively sort this information as a sane man with zero restraining orders? Opera has come from the godless, wretched wastes of Scandinavia to save me from the sins of my chaos and uncertainty. If I wanted to be confused and overwhelmed, I'd go outside again. But with Opera and their intuitive tab islands, I never need to do that again. The fire hose of information, opinions, and outright garbage that is the internet can be intuitively sorted, grouped, and perused on the fly. Let's be honest, the internet has gotten worse. So the way we use it has to get better. With Opera's intuitive tab islands, every time I use them, I feel like I can organize, save space, and browse effortlessly. Click my link and download Opera now before you lose that source you just found. Oh god damn it, where was it? It was just here! Click my link in the description. Learn about tabfulness and the serenity it shall bring you. Ascend to Nirvana and become a better internet user. Thank you, Opera, for sponsoring this video and bringing me enlightenment. Now, some of you may say this video is late, but those people are, of course, incorrect. What's with all these Game of the Year videos happening before the end of the year? Like, what if there was an indie buzzer beater, right? Well, while all those other games journalists were celebrating New Year's with their friends and family, I was refreshing the Steam New Releases tab and playing every new anime nightmare that dropped right up until midnight, just in case it was the next Hollow Knight. That's right, I'm professionally responsible, unlike all those losers with their dog and pony shows sponsored by Mountain Dew. Anyway, I did not play Baldur's Gate 3, I was too busy reading 500 year old lies, go fuck yourself. As we go through my list of games I wish to discuss, Discovery is going to feature as a prominent theme. I spent a year reading the accounts of bold men at the edge of the world, meeting strange people and charting strange places that had yet to be seen by a man that wore sunscreen. There is something to that. An inescapable charm to Discovery that no amount of sad graphs can destroy. My one and only gaming video was about the poor sense of Discovery in Tears of the Kingdom. I found that there was little to find at all. And this year, that is what I wanted from games. Genuine, tangible discovery. Make me feel something, you cold, cynical programs. If you want to fix the male mental health crisis or whatever it is that Pfizer made up this week, 
This is how. Create an entirely new continent, with no people on it this time, God, and let our world's young men go chart its weird creatures and features in an orgy of bold exploration. And of course, they will eventually settle down on these virgin lands, roll up their sleeves, and fucking ruin them with parking lots. I don't need medication. I need to find uncharted virgin land. Every day I wake up, and Terra Australis still doesn't exist. But this is not what Dredge is about, you think, as you start the game, fishing in a shallow harbor in your cute little boat. But of course, dark things dwell beneath the... Alright, Dredge gives up the game pretty fast. Every person is creepy. You keep finding weird fish. What the fuck? And at night, the cold fog rolling over the water chills your very soul. You get it. There's a Lovecraftian undercurrent to Dredge, which is very obvious. Imagine a child holding something behind their back. They ask you to guess what they have, then you do, and it's a dead squirrel. And it's really fucking creepy and weird. But then, they put you through this whole thing once every two minutes for the rest of the day. What I'm trying to say is that the game is way too fucking excited about the Lovecraft stuff, and it will show you this stuff with all the enthusiasm of a young child holding something fucked up. My little brother once, and I'm quoting directly from my father here, came to the door holding fistfuls of snakes. Don't worry, they were alive. Or do worry, they were alive. A child showing you something just a little fucked up and beaming with pride has its own sort of weird charm. Dredge is not scary. It just found something scary and is excited to show you. In Dredge, you sail a little ship around a small but dense archipelago, catching fish by completing little mini-games and selling those fish for money, which you use for equipment upgrades, which let you sail farther and farther so you can catch bigger and bigger fish, which you can sell for more and more money. Look, you've played a video game before. Dredge's appeal comes from its cutesy Lovecraft charm and excellent exploration. I want to list out all the cool and surprising things you'll find, but, of course, I want you to go find them. Maybe you just should. The biggest problem with Dredge is its depth. I've totally unplugged from the gaming industry, but I'm sure I'm the first guy to make that joke. The game, once you've explored everything, is just like a few mini-games with a weirdly annoyingly fast day-night cycle attached. I've talked about my issue with Skyrim before, and it is the issue with every game with great exploration. Once you've figured out where everything is, the game's actual systems suddenly need to bear the weight of all this scrutiny that they didn't need to before. What you're seeing here, this, This isn't actually very fun, I know, you're shocked. When you know what's in every cave in Skyrim, it's just a shitty RPG because that's all that's left. And when you've navigated every coast in Dredge, it's just a shitty fishing game that probably could have been put on a phone. Listen, Dredge is good. Do not mistake, some late game apathy is representative of the whole experience. Even when the exploration is removed, what is here is a fundamentally solid gameplay loop with rewarding upgrades, but, you know after 30 hours. All right, there's a decent chance the game was minimized for a while, but I don't know. What, what I'm saying is I didn't finish it and I didn't really feel the need to finish it. I'm sure something big and spooky happens at the end, but I don't think I want something big and spooky to happen. I like these kooky little seaside hamlets filled with weirdos. I like waving to Cthulhu cultists from the bow of my ship as I head out to my favorite fishing hole. I highly recommend that you check Dredge out as it is my game of 2023. All right, fine, you're a real cobbler thug. You want the hard shit, the real shit. You know I don't just make jokes and review games because that would mean I was doing my job consistently and well. No, 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 I'm here to give you the last game of the year, forever and in perpetuity. But before I do that, I'm going to spend five minutes insulting garbage. The first two Elder Scrolls games, Arena and Daggerfall, are some of the largest game worlds ever created. But hold that Game of the Century award there, Timmy, because they cheated. But let's establish first just how beefy these boys were before we explore the problem. There's a YouTube channel called How Big Is The Map? where a gentleman with several undiagnosed varieties of autism which can only be caught by licking that type of root in the Amazon that jaguars chew to get high, walks across game maps in their totality. If you will look up his Daggerfall video, you will see... 
These maps were procedurally generated, and that is reflected in the footage if you decide to sit down and watch it during your next psychotic break. Arena and Daggerfall both taking this approach were financial successes, but they are far from the juggernaut the series would later become. Following Daggerfall, Bethesda released some spin-offs for the series, and they did not do well, and it nearly put the company under. Bethesda, backed into a corner and facing imminent bankruptcy, decided to bet the farm on a new mainline Elder Scrolls game, whose development was overseen by a young up-and-coming chess club whiz kid. The Elder Scrolls III, Morrowind, still made some mistakes. Notably, there are zero titty barbarians on the cover due to the woke left, but it made one great decision. The world was around 0.01% the size of arenas. Rather than randomly generating a shitload of fuck all, just to brag about it, Bethesda elected to handcraft a series of memorable landscapes and locations, creating a world as alien as it is fantastical. Arena and Daggerfall were trying to convince you how big their dicks were. Morrowind is trying to get you off. I wasn't going to talk about Starfield, because every time I tried, I would get mad, and it would devolve into this, and it felt really immature, like, even for me, until I realized I'm not a gaming YouTuber. I don't get codes for free, I don't get invited to things, I don't get early access. I've, I've gotten early access to one game and it was fucking Chernobylite. I'm not a gaming YouTuber. I'm a customer and I'm fucking furious that I was cheated out of my money. $70 is my internet bill every month. It's a night out with my fiance. I gave them $70 and they gave me the garbage, their stupid fucking equation shit out. They ripped me off and I should be mad. When I want to make a video, I get an idea, I write, I research, I edit, you know, I, I, I sit down and I make it. I don't hire people to make an equation that makes a video, because that would be fucking stupid, wouldn't it? Why is Bethesda so desperately trying to get rid of level designers and writers? Like, that's the thing about the Starfield procedural generation whatever bullshit. It's just a cost-saving measure. It simply has to be, because I don't understand why the fuck else they'd be doing this. Skyrim had one good thing going for it, and they automated it! And then they had the gall to go on the internet and argue with the people they ripped off. Todd Howard, after shitting his unoptimized garbage onto my computer, went and said this. Why did you not optimize this game for PC? Uh, we did. It's running great. It is a next-gen PC game. We really do push the technology, so... Blow me! When I play Starfield, I feel like a computer is taking a hot diarrhea shit down my throat. Instead of making a game, they made an equation and a bunch of menus and systems. None of them come together. None of them have a point. It is artless, hollow, joyless slop. Stop making equations. Make games. To misquote the worst insult I've ever heard a critic say, I do not know why you would want to make a game like this. Know your fucking place, trash. Okay, Todd. I'm gonna make more than $70 from this video, so we're gonna call it even until you release Elder Scrolls VI, which will of course just turn out to be a Minecraft texture pack, because Bethesda, apparently, is now only interested in making shittier versions of Minecraft forever. Anyway, we're done fucking around. This is the main show. You see, I want to talk about a game that came to me years ago, and it actually made me reflect on myself, and all my choices, on my circumstances. It is, in fact, the most influential game on who I am as a person, without a doubt. It was a game that sat me down and said, hey, let's talk. Let's talk about your past, past your, your future. future. Your very light. Dark Souls 2, 2, Scholar of the First Sin, is my game of 2023 and every year thereafter. From Software, I suggest you quit fucking around and finally release Dark Souls 2, 3, Pupil of the Second Sin, so you can capitalize on the metric shitload of Doritos-stained gamer dollars that are rapidly approaching your location! I've got a very diverse audience nowadays. Not in the college pamphlet way. I can't say for sure, but I'm guessing all my viewers get regularly sunburned. What I really mean is that I make videos about a lot of stuff now, and while there's a shitload of overlap between guys that like video games and World War II history, for reasons, that does not apply to all of history. 
What I'm trying to say is that Dark Souls 2 has a reputation, which must be explained. Okay, so the fall of the Aztec Empire is a less divisive event than the release of Dark Souls 2, and some would argue they had a similar casualty rate. Dark Souls 2 has the unfortunate distinction of being the only one of the Dark Souls games not directed by Hidetaka Miyazaki, a man who has become absolute gamer royalty over the past decade. Dark Souls 2 was directed, rather, by Yu Tanimura. To quote Mr. Tanimura, Dark Souls 2 actually went through quite a troubled development process. Due to a number of factors, we were actually forced to rethink the entire game midway into development. We really had to go back to the drawing board and think once more about what a Dark Souls game should be. It was at that point that I took on my current role, overseeing the entirety of the game, including the art direction. I do not envy Mr. Tanimura. Dark Souls 3 is generally criticized for repeating too many locations and referencing the original game too much, which normally wouldn't be a problem because, you know, it's a fucking sequel, but Mr. Tanimura made it a problem. The reason for Dark Souls 3 having such an odd criticism levied against it is that Yu Tanimura defined what a Dark Souls sequel was. He created an expectation that Dark Souls installments would have only the most bare minimum connection to earlier games in the franchise. Dark Souls 2 takes place an indeterminate but certainly massive amount of time after the original. You explore the Kingdom of Drang Lake, which is built on the kingdom in which you were in the first game, Lordran, but that's the thing. It appears that many kingdoms have been built on Lordran. The world you fought to save in the original is fucking buried under countless other saved kingdoms. Dark Souls 2 was a game that fundamentally had a little identity crisis, struggled to find what it wanted to say, and it does feel, in many ways, a little mangled as a consequence. It is definitely the least polished out of the trilogy. And I think that might be why I love it so much. I find great pathos in something a little mangled, finally finding what it wants to say. I think what bothers me about this story we tell each other about Dark Souls 2, about how it was made by some B-team nobody before the real guy came back and made everything good again, is that what you're saying is the most powerful message of the entire series, a message that could only be communicated with a sequel, was just some fluke made up by some idiot. Yui Tanimura is still at From Software. He's clearly very talented and hardworking. Like, look at his resume, dude. You want art to be made efficiently, with a clear structured plan and goalposts that don't move? Go buy a fucking Ubisoft game. Would you believe me if I told you that the writing process for this video is the most difficult I've ever experienced? Seriously, out of all the stuff that I've done, this was the hardest. Because I found myself standing at the decrepit gate of this long neglected part of my channel. The part that I've been doing the longest. And I found myself not really knowing why. I've done 10 drafts, easily. I've had to throw away big sections that I've recorded and edited. It's been an absolute nightmare. And I figure the end result probably shows this. This shit is mangled. But the point is, this is my last gaming video. I don't want to be sappy about it, on one hand, as I just spent five minutes screaming about how Todd ripped me off. But, on the other hand, all those YouTubers that walked into the sunset this year, you know, I'm not gonna get that. I don't get a sunset. Eventually, I'm just gonna say something wrong, and I'm gonna get ritualistically sacrificed by YouTube, or you're all gonna learn what I did in the Balkans because I need to be your buddy for some fucking reason, or the internet will get choked with AI garbage which I can't break through, or hey, maybe YouTube just dies. Who knows? It sorta sucks right now. When that happens, when I'm compelled by forces outside my control to stop, I need to have an answer for why I did this. All of this. I've said all I've had to say about video games and I had so much fun doing it. But I think that if there's been a single through line, a single idea that I just keep coming back to, it's that there needs to be a why, a reason for the game's existence, some spark or heart somewhere in all of the machinery of systems and graphics and menus. My heart is not in this anymore, and I can't say why I'm doing it. My heart is now in things that you thankfully seem to like as well, and in things that I can't wait to show you in the future. I'm talking about my OnlyFans. For the few of you that are still here, I've got something to show you. And it's not a dead squirrel this time. It's the first video I ever made. It's terrible. It has 134 views, and it's been unlisted for a very, very long time. 
thank you for watching. It means the world to me. Ubisoft has made four Far Cry games since Far Cry 3. Oh, I'm sorry. I read that wrong. Ubisoft has made Far Cry 3 four times. They always change the name, add in a feature or two. There was that time they threw in elephants, that time they added in woolly mammoths, and that time they put it in America because they'd run out of giant pachyderms and figured Americans were the next best thing. But it's always Far Cry 3. Now, I never played Far Cry 1 because I was... seven years old. And I also didn't play Far Cry 2 because it too closely resembled my ordinary day-to-day -day life of taking malaria pills and getting shot at. Yes, I'm from New Orleans. So Far Cry 3 was my first time playing the series. I loved it. Which is why it's weird that I hate the fact that every video game Ubisoft makes now is just Far Cry 3. So after playing Far Cry 5 for the first time recently, and being bored shitless in a record-breaking two hours, I decided to boot up Far Cry 3 again and see if it held up. And wow, it does hold up. This game makes me feel like Rambo like no other game has managed to. Wait, no, like, actually good. This game is a 20 hour long drug-fueled bloodbath, and every part of the game works together to give it that feeling. Even the super cliché Alice in Wonderland illusions work in this context, and it just feels so sincere. The loading screens, the hunting mechanics, the drugs, even the lame protagonist, Jason Brody. Fuck, that is the saltine cracker of names. I seem to be in the minority of people that actually like Jason Brody, not on a personal level, but on a story level. Yeah, he's some annoying white rich kid, but that's what makes it interesting when he slowly turns into Rambo on bath salts. So why has no Far Cry since then been able to capture the same magic? Who could possibly answer this question that me, a guy with zero game design knowledge, keeps asking? You know what, I'm an expert and I got this. I think the answer is on the surface, simple passion. The people making Far Cry 3 gave a shit. How do I know this? Well, the way I judge every video game is by the drowning animation. Okay, I know it sounds stupid, but just hear me out. Let's take a look at what happens when Jason Brody has finally gotten sick of spending all day chugging Natty Light with his boys, and finally decides to end it all. Now let's see the same thing in Far Cry 5. Now, obviously, this is a tiny part of the actual game. I mean, come on, drowning? Come on! Seriously, who cares? So you see a Rorschach test that looks like my naked mother. Neat. You know what? You're right. Let's look at something else, something actually important. The sound effect that plays when you pick up a collectible. Obviously, this is the key to any good video game. Now, like any other mentally stable human being, I don't actually care about getting collectibles. Although some people do enjoy picking up every collectible in a game. Okay, okay. In all seriousness, let's just pretend for a moment that I murder homeless people because I enjoy collecting their skins and also love playing video games. If so, what would I experience when picking stuff up in Far Cry 3? Okay, now Far Cry 5. I mean, is it a huge difference? Sure, there's a little chanting thing when you pick up the stuff in 3 as opposed to 5. And I guess if you were a loser in a dark room talking into a microphone, you may argue it's a small touch that adds to the atmosphere of the game, but really, what does it matter? You're right, it doesn't. Even IG too much water, a little something for everyone 10 out of 10 N wouldn't judge a game based on that. So let's take a look at some real shit. Some real gamer shit. Gamer shit. <sighs> With the exception of the beginning and the end, there are almost no actual cutscenes. Now, for some games, obviously, I'm completely fine with that. In fact, I usually don't like cutscenes at all. But, I mean, 
they're a good way of getting information across, especially if you don't feel like putting in the effort to do it in an organic way. I mean, this is not Dark Souls or Half-Life 2. This is Far Cry. And a lazy one at that. I mean, why the fuck does every character stare into my soul Skyrim style as they vomit some shit about the cult at me in Far Cry 5? How is this an improvement over this? Why is stealth worse than 3? Why do I need to pay money for the smiley face shovel when clearly it's integral to the whole experience? Why do you play as a silent protagonist? Do you realize how much personality you could have added to the game with a voiced protagonist? Oh, fuck. Yeah, okay. Bad example. What I'm trying to say is Far Cry 3 was oozing with little touches, and that's what made it a classic. Well, it would be a classic, if its sequels didn't follow it and tarnish its reputation by recycling the mechanics and losing every ounce of charm it originally had. I mean, imagine if there was a game like Far Cry 3 that had also just been done to death ever since it came out, even if it was initially an instant classic. Uh, I don't know, like Far Cry 3 but without the guns or something, or... Wait, what does that say? Oh yeah, that. Imagine if Skyrim had a bunch of soulless cash grabs over the years that... Oh, yeah. You know what? Never mind. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, right? I guess that still holds true, you know, even if it's just you imitating yourself from back when you took some risks, you dumb French fucks. Not you, Todd. You know I love you.